All right, so in this video, we're going to take a look at some introduction to electricity type questions. OK, so starting off as a rough guide, copper wires can conduct about 10 amps per millimeter squared. That's their cross sectional area, by the way, before they overheat. And there are approximately 10 to the 20 free electrons per millimeter cubed in copper. The number of electrons per second required to carry a current of 10 amps. So first of all, let's consider what 10 amps is. So one electron has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And 10 amps is 10 coulombs per second. Uh, so if we take that 10 and divide by the charge of one electron, that tells me how many electrons per second have to pass through for a current of 10 amps. So the length of wire with cross-sectional area one millimeter squared containing this number of electrons. So we know that one millimeter cubed has 10 to the 20. So if we do the number that we've calculated divided by 10 to the 20, that will tell us the volume that has the electrons we need. And if the cross-sectional area is one millimeter squared, that gives us the length as 0.625 millimeters. And then the final thing we want, the average drift speed of electrons in the wire. So I think there are two ways of doing this. So using that distance we've just calculated, we could do uh, distance divided by time, the time being one second, because we've done everything per second, and that gives us 0.65 millimeters per second, pretty small speed. Or we could use what I call the i naive equation, uh, and the drift speed being that V, and we can we know what the current is. We know the free electron density, but I've converted it into uh, free electrons per meter cubed, which is what we need for the um, expression. The cross-sectional area, again, I've put it in meters squared. Charge of electron, we know, and we, we get exactly the same answer. Okay, so if the same wire carried a current of only 10 milliamps, what would the drift speed be? And how long would it take a typical electron to drift through one meter? So um, as long as we don't change the cross-sectional area or the charge we're using or anything like that, current and drift speed are directly proportional. So if we divide the current by a thousand, we're going to divide the drift speed by a thousand. And then, uh, so that's in millimeters per second. If we then do the distance, which is one millimeter, divided by the, uh, the speed, that gives us a time of 1,600 seconds. Okay, so an X-ray machine works by accelerating electrons through a high voltage in a vacuum tube, and then those electrons crash into a target, producing heat and X-rays. Okay, so um, the tube current determines the quantity of X-rays produced, and the penetration of the X-rays is determined by the potential difference. So the potential difference sets the amount of energy the electrons have, and the current says how many electrons per second we're going to have. Okay. So for the pelvis, we've got a, a voltage of 65 kV, whereas for a hand, it's 40. OK, so it wants to know how much charge and how much energy do the electrons in the tube deliver during each exposure. So um, I'm going to use the fact that the charge is the integral of, a, uh, of current with respect to time. Now, you are probably more familiar with this equation, Q equals I. T, um, but that equation assumes that current is constant. So if we integrate this where the current is a constant, we can see we come out with Q equals I T. Uh, but the more general form is the integral of I, so I'm going to be using that form. And then we know the current, which I've converted into amps, and we know the time, and that gives us our charge, and we can repeat that process for the hand there. If we want to do the energy, I'm going to go through a similar process. So energy is the integral of power with respect to time. Uh, power is calculated by doing current times voltage. Both of those two things are constants, so that just becomes IVT. And we do our calculation, as, and we can do the same thing again. We could also do this using the equation E equals QV. That would work as well. OK, so explain why there are differences in the energy and penetration required. Uh, well, the key is the pelvic bone is much thicker than the hand bone. And therefore, you're going to need a higher penetration for the pelvis, and you're going to therefore need higher energy. 
Okay, so for the pelvis example, find the number of electrons arriving per second. Uh, so I'm going to do this the same way I did the question earlier. Uh, the 0.35 amps is 0.35 coulombs per second. Divide that by the charge of one electron, and that will give you the number of electrons per second. Then to get the energy of each electron, uh, so it was accelerated through a potential difference of 65 kV, which means it's going to end up with 65,000 electron volts of kinetic energy. And then, well, one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 joules, so we can do the conversion really easily, 1 times 10 to minus 14 joules. Hence, find the number of electrons arriving during the eight seconds of exposure and check that the total energy agrees with your answer. So, uh, the number of electrons is going to be the number of electrons that arrive in one second times by 0.8, gives us 1.75 times 10 to 18 electrons. We multiply that by the energy we've calculated, and we can see we come up with the same energy we had before, 1.8 times 10 to the 4. Okay, so moving on to something a little bit different. Ten lamps are connected in series across a power supply. The voltage across each lamp is six volts. What is the voltage of the supply? Uh, well, it's going to be 60 volts, so six times ten. Explain how you've used Kirchhoff's laws to derive this. Well, Kirchhoff's second law says that the sum of the EMFs equals the sum of the potential differences in a closed loop. So the sum of the potential differences is going to be 60, because in a series circuit there's basically just one loop going around everything. Therefore, the EMF source must also be 60 volts. Explain why this must be true in terms of energy. So I'm actually going to use power instead of energy, but they're not that different really in terms of conservation. So according to conservation of energy, the power of the EMF source must be equal to the power of the bulbs, or Essentially, the number of joules per second we take out of our circuit must be equal to the number of joules per second we put in. Uh, the power, I'm going to use P equals IV. So the power input is going to be the current times the EMF. The power output is 10 times the current times the potential difference. And they're in series, so the current is the same, so the I's cancel out and we get the EMF is 10 V. The 10 lamps are connected across in parallel. Draw a diagram of that circuit. Uh, well, it's not very much used to draw 10 bulbs out in parallel, so I've drawn a shortcut version like you can see here, uh, giving us a total of 10 bulbs in parallel across a 12 volt supply. What's the voltage of it across each lamp? Well, it's 12 volts. And the next question is going to ask us how we can use Kirchhoff's law to prove that. So let's look at that now. So this is my closed loop that I'm going to pick. The sum of the EMFs is 12 volts, so the sum of the potential differences must be 12 volts, and the light bulb is the only potential difference in that loop, so that must be all 12 volts. How do you use Kirchhoff's second order? We've just done that, so that's fine. How can we justify this in terms of energy? So I'm going to do the same thing I did before. The power of the EMF source must be equal to the power of the bulbs put together. Uh, the power of the EMF source is the same, current times the EMF. The power of the bulbs, well there are 10 of them, so that's why it's times by 10. The current going through each bulb must be I over 10, because it must split into 10 equal parts. We're essentially using Kirchhoff's current law there. And the potential difference is V, uh, so we again end up with the EMFs equal to V. So we still get the same expression. So the ammeter reads X, so the one that's in series with those three resistors reads X. What is true about about the voltages across the two branches on the left of the circuit. Uh, so we're talking about this section here. The uh, potential difference across the two branches is the same. And how does the Kirchhoff's second law show this? Well, we've got a loop drawn on there. So we also need to show the direction of the current through them. Uh, so I'm going to call V1 potential difference across the top branch and V2 potential difference across the bottom. And we can see the current going through V1 is up in the opposite direction to the loop. So that's going to be a minus. That's why it's minus V1. V2 is in the direction of the loop, so that's why it's plus V2. And we can see the sum of the EMFs in that loop is zero, and therefore we end up with V1 equals V2. Use this to determine the current or in the top branch. So if potential difference is the same, current and resistance are inversely proportional. So in the 
top loop, the resistance is one third of the bottom loop, so the current must be three times bigger, or 3x. What must the current be in the interlink section? Uh, well, it must be 4x, because we know the sum of the currents going into the interlink section is x plus 3x, uh, so that must be 4x. How does your answer come from the ideas about charge? Uh, well, if char charge has to be conserved, the number of charges entering a point each second must be equal to the sum of the charges leaving, because uh, the point is not capable of holding any charges. Um, so that gives us this rule that we use. Hence, what is the current in, in terms of x of the black resistor? It must be 2x, because it's the 4x is split equally between the two identical parallel resistances. Here is a list of electrical units. Choose the correct unit for current. Uh, one amp is a coulomb per second. Resistance is a volt per amp. The potential difference is a joule per coulomb. Okay, voltage divided by current is resistance, so that's going to be a ohm. Energy divided by time is power, so that's going to be a watt. Current times time is a coulomb, uh, assuming that the charge uh, current is the same that is. Okay, so a battery during its usable lifetime supplies a constant current of 40 microamps to a clock for 800 days. How much charge does the battery supply during this time? Uh, well, I'm going to use the integral of current with respect to time to get charge. Uh, we convert to microamps times 10 to minus 6. We also convert days into seconds and that gives us our charge in coulombs. I, at this point I would also point out that although the battery has emitted that many coulombs of charge it's also taken in that many coulombs on the opposite side so there's been no net change in the number of charges inside the battery. Okay so an early experimenter working in units other than SI units measures the charge on tiny ore droplets. Each oil droplet was charged by just a few electrons. The charges he obtained were these ones. What value do these results suggest for the charge on the electron as measured in these units? So this is, looks an awful lot like Millikan's oil drop experiment, the experiment where you measure the charge of an electron. Um, and the key to this is all of these numbers must be an integer multiple of the fundamental charge, the charge of the electron. And the thing we can use to spot what the fundamental one is, is finding the smallest difference between numbers. So I found it between 39.28 and 34.37. That's the smallest difference. A difference of zero doesn't tell us anything. And then once we've done that, uh, that gives us the best guess at what the fundamental unit, the charge of an electron is. A typical car headlamp draws a current of 5.7 amps from the battery. It's switched on for 40 minutes. How many electrons pass through a given point in the filament bulb? And so again, using the integral of current with respect to time, converting minutes into seconds to give us our charge in coulombs, dividing that by the charge on one electron to give us the number of electrons. Okay, so we've got a charger from a mobile phone supplies a current of 240 milliamps for an hour how many electrons are supplied. So first of all, we calculate the charge using the same method we've been using before, converting into amps and converting into seconds. And then taking that answer, divided by the charge of an electron, gives us the number of electrons, which is option C. Okay, so a woman touches the body of a car that's become charged during its journey. A current of 10 milliamps passes through her for 20 milliseconds. How much charge flows through? So again, we're using the same methods here. Uh, Q equals IT, converting into amps and converting into seconds gives us our charge. A cell is connected to a resistor and the current is measured. The graph shows how the current varies with time. How much charge passes through the cell during this time? So this is where the fact the integral I've been doing becomes important because the current is not the same the whole time. And remember, integration is basically finding the area under the graph. So the number of charges is going to be the area under the graph, 
um, but I'm converting into amps and converting into seconds. So we've got a rectangle for one hour, uh, so that's easy. Then we've got trapezium for the next four hours. Uh, so we're doing the average of the two sides times the base, and that gives us a total charge of 4,680, which is option B. Okay. Uh, which statements about dry cells is not correct? So we're basically talking about cells in a circuit. A six volt cell transfers six joules of energy to every coulomb of charge passing through it. Uh, that's exactly what a six volt cell, that's what that means. Um, conventional current flows through a cell from the negative terminal to the positive. Uh, yes, that's true, because externally around the circuit, conventional current goes from the positive terminal to the negative. So inside the cell, it must go from negative to positive to finish the loop. Inside a cell, chemical energy is used to do work on electric charges. Yep, we use chemical energy to increase the electric potential energy effectively. And when a cell becomes discharged, it's used up its store of electric charge. Nope, if for every charge a battery emits, it takes in another one on the opposite terminal, so that's not true. Okay, so a torch is switched on and left until its battery is flat, so which means it's run out of energy, not run out of charge. During the time, the current is 0.6 amps for three hours and then decreases uniformly to zero for the next hour. What is the total charge passing through the lamp? So again, we're going to be using the area. So to start with, it's going to be a rectangle because it's a constant current for three hours. Then it's going to be a triangle because it decreases uniformly. Uh, so we've got the area of the rectangle first, the area of the triangle second, and that gives us our total charge. Okay, so finishing off with some circuitry questions. State Kirchhoff's first law. That's the sum of the current entering a point equals the sum of the current leaving it. Well, you sometimes see the sum of the currents at a point is zero uh, and you assign plus or minus signs. That kind of works too. Okay, so we've got a diagram showing a network of resistors. The currents, are some of them are shown, reduce the other values of current. So I1 must be the sum of I2 and I3, uh, so it must be 3.25. I4 must be the difference between I2 and I5, uh, so that's got to be 0.25. I6 is the sum of I4 and I3, uh, so that's going to be 1.35. And then the final one, I7, must be equal to I1, because the current entering must be equal to the current leaving. State Kirchhoff's second law, uh, in a closed loop around the circuit, uh, the sum of the EMFs equals the sum of the potential differences. Okay, so the diagram shows a circuit that includes a 12 volt battery with no internal resistance and five resistors. Potential differences across the five resistors are shown. Deduce the potential differences V1, V2 and V3. Uh, so I'm first of all going to figure out what uh, V3 and V1 are. Those are the easy ones, and then V2 is the less straightforward one. So this is my first loop. Uh, some of the EMFs is 12. Some of the potential difference is currently 9.6, which means V1 must be 2.4 to make the sum of the PDs 12. Okay. The next loop I'm going to pick is this one. So V3 must be 8 volts, using some of the PDs equals 12. The last loop is the more fiddly one, uh, which is not so easy to draw. I'm going to use this loop. Now, the sum of the potential differences here is currently 13.6, which must mean that V2 is 1.6. It's actually minus 1.6 to make the sum of the PDs equal to 12. Um, but we'll get onto that for the next question. Okay, so the direction of the current between points A and B, well, it must be going from B towards A, that, so that in the loop it gives a potential difference of minus 1.6. So the current going through it is in the opposite direction to the loop, and that gives you some of the potential differences equals 12 volts of some of the EMFs in that loop we already drew. Kirchhoff's first law and Kirchhoff's second law are each related to a different principle of conservation. What is conserved in each law. So Kirchhoff's first law is a conservation of charge law, and the second law is a conservation of energy law. And that completes this video.